Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord to everybody. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for joining us tonight for a, another Wednesday Bible study. And tonight we have a special treat. Uh, and we're very glad to have uh, our panelists who are going to come and uh, share some things with us and give their opinions and thoughts. And we're delighted to have them. But we're also delighted to have those who are in the audience as well. We're glad that you're here. And those of you who are on social media, we're equally as happy that you have joined us tonight in the house of God for a Wednesday night Bible study. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could leave here with a nugget, with a gem, with a principle, with a concept that we can actually apply in our life? The Bible says man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And it would be just a joy if we heard something tonight that could impact our lives just in a little way. But in that little way, certainly would be a great way. So we are excited tonight uh, for this Bible study. We have a lot of ground to cover, and we don't <clears throat> want to take much more time. So with all of our Bible studies, we open up with the word of prayer because we want to acknowledge the Lord. It's kind of like when you have your, your breakfast or your meal, you always thank the Lord for your meal before you consume it. It's a sign of humility. Uh, it's a sign of consciousness that God is with us. So before we receive this delicious meal to, tonight, I know it's going to be good. I think it'd be fitting that we open up with the word of prayer. Father, we just want to acknowledge you, and we dare not go any further without first saying thank you. Before we hear anything, we want to first thank you for everything that you have done. And I pray tonight, during this Bible study, that you will speak to us. I pray, God, that you will give us an aha moment. Give us insight. Give us wisdom. Let something be said, God, that will build our faith. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. So, God, we thank you for those who are serving on the panel tonight. We thank you, Lord, for those who are in the sanctuary. We thank you, Lord, for those who are on social media who have joined us tonight. We thank you. Now, Lord, bless this session tonight. Be glorified in all that is said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And our focus tonight is, is resetting, resetting your mind with the word of God. For the month of May, it was Mental Awareness Month. And during that month, the entire month, we dealt with something about mental illness. I think we start off the, the month with Pastor Stevens was did a study of the, the guy who had uh, demons. He was possessed with demons. And the Gyrian guy and Jesus cast out that devil. And he was, he mentally, he was, he was having some issues. He was cutting himself, crying throughout the night. Um, I, obviously, he had a suicidal problem. But we start off the month of May looking at a man that Jesus healed and how Jesus reset his mind. And then we had some very, uh, very good panelists who came in and, and shared some wonderful concepts uh, about mental uh, illness, mental awareness, and then we had guest speakers, and now we want to wrap this up with a final panel discussion, a final panel discussion of individuals who are going to come and respond to some questions that we have, that we have designed. Without further notice, I want to introduce them to you. Those in the congregation are well aware of those who are on this, on this uh, platform, but perhaps there's someone in our audience who may not be familiar with those individuals who are on the platform. I'm going to ask each of them, starting from my right to my left, if they will introduce themselves and give us just a brief snippet of who they are. Praise the Lord. My name is Carol Battle Barnes. I guess the most important thing is that I love the Lord and he loves me. Amen. Saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and fire baptized and proud of it. <laughs> my background, uh, I am a retired educator. I have taught, I have been a school counselor and an administrator as well as assistant superintendent. My years as a counselor, uh, I would say would pro is what probably uh, will lend most to this session. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everyone. 
I will open by saying, as related to our topics, if it had not been for the Lord, who's on my side, I don't know where I would be. And so I just thank God for being here and being a part of this. I'm Tim Staples, and a lot of my background is working with young people. I've worked in schools, um, taught every grade from kindergarten through college. Um, currently, a lot of my work uh, that lends to the discussion is at university work. Uh, we have th uh, something called care teams at every university, as Dr. Rice will tell you. Um, and I worked as a care team uh, leader, which reports would come to me and then I kind of triage um, those, those reports. Also experienced as a retired young people's leader in, in, in PAW churches. Um, then a lot of, of, of knowledge and experience to this. And the last thing I'll say that it, um, I believe the pa uh, one of the panelists mentioned that I have had the psychological first aid training, and I know that's something Pastor would like to bring to our um, congregation, and it, it is a wonderful training. Praise the Lord. My name is Nidra Crisp. Um, I'm a member here at uh, Temple Church, Church of Christ, retired teacher as well from the area of special education. And as far as the background of working in mental health, I've worked with students uh, with disabilities, with all kinds of problems along those lines. I taught children that had uh, emotional disturbances. I've dealt with kids that have been learning disabled. I've dealt with children that were suspected to have had drug abuse or drug um, drug babies, if you will, in, in, their, in their heritage. And so for me, um, I guess I'm here because I love God and I have a, a testimony. And I know that the Lord is a healer and I know that God can provide and he can, put, he can make everything work out all right. Um, what I bring to the, to the table, I suppose, is my enthusiasm and my faith in God. And if it had not been for the Lord, I too know where would I be. I would not be here. Amen. Praise the Lord. I am Gerald E. Freeman. I am a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, have been residing uh, in St. Louis now for the past five years. My discipline is in the background of human resource management, and now I am a director of facilities, and God has given me favor within the Jewish community, and so I oversee a Jewish school, a Jewish boys and girls school here uh, in St. Louis. Pastored for 20 years in, Saint Lu in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and then for two years here uh, in St. Louis. And so I bring um, to this, this arena, to this conversation, um, not only the answers from God's word, um, but the anointing that God gives for us um, through the word that would destroy yokes. And so I'm honored to be here tonight. Amen. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Let's start with our question. We have a series of questions that we'd like to ask. Um, question number one. And I'll start with you, uh, Pastor Joe Freeman. Is it, is it wrong for a spirit-filled Christian to seek counseling? All the preaching and teaching and Bible study that we do, is it, is it wrong or is it appropriate that a spirit-filled believer, having heard so much word, praying frequently, reading God's word, meditating, why, is he, why does she or he need a counselor? Talk to us. Great question, Bishop. Thank you so much for posing that. Um, obviously, it's never wrong to seek help, to seek assistance. Proverbs 11 tells us that in the multitude of counselors, there's great safety. Yes. When we uh, are on an island to ourselves, we can convince ourselves that we are right, and perhaps we are. Um, but it might be an outsider who, and I'm going to give us three points, um, who is discerning. Um, who's able to discern the mind of God, who's able to discern um, the subject matter or the situation. And so we need men and women in our lives who can speak to us from a discerning um, posture. I, I think the second thing is bringing outside counselors is beneficial uh, because we'll find people that are disassociated or disconnected with us. And so they'll be able to see from an angle um, that we may not see. It, it's hard to see the whole picture just looking through uh, a peephole, but if I can open the door 
and get a greater perspective. And so um, bringing someone who's disassociated or disconnected. And then lastly, um, someone who's not afraid to be disapproving, disapproving of our behavior, disapproving of our action, disapproving of our thoughts, and can bring us some guidelines and some correction um, that would help us to be stable. So yeah, Proverbs 11, 4, um, 14 says, in the multitude of counselors, there's great safety. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Pastor, we appreciate that response. Let's turn to the right, the question number two, Sister Carol. Uh, in most churches, and I think you would agree with this, I think the audience would agree with this as well, there, there is a lack of availability for professional counselors in response to mental illness. In your opinion, Sister Carol, how does a person go about finding a Christian counselor? The second part of the question, should it be a licensed counselor or just someone who is highly anointed? Okay. Very good question. The first thing I would say is that if a person is seeking professional help, there are many, they can go and find many things online. There are actually uh, Christian Counselor Network. There's actually the Black Christian Therapy or, uh, org, and it has a directory of therapists. So there are uh, many outlets where you can find a therapist and you can choose who you feel would be best for you. There's also online, you can choose whether or not you want to be an in -per with an in-person counselor or you can determine whether or not you want to uh, counsel online or video uh, counseling. Now the second part of that question, it depends on the nature of the problem. As the scripture that was read by a pastor over there, he stated good, that godly counsel is what we look for. Sometimes you can find godly counsel in the church among the wise, among those who are more experienced than you, are those who just have, God has blessed them to be able to talk and, and give comfort. However, as I said, depending on the nature of the problem, and if the nature of the problem calls for a more serious or if you aren't comfortable talking to someone in the church, then you go, would go to an outside counselor. But yes, you can find counsel within the church and outside the church. Amen. Thank you for that response. Question number three, turn, I'll turn to my right. Sister Nitra, Minister Nitra. Nitra. I thought the Holy Ghost was sent to comfort us. God said he would never leave us comfortless. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. He said he would never leave us comfortless. Why aren't people taking advantage of the comfort that Christ has for us? I can only speak for myself. And basically, in the times of my life when I was dealing with this, a lot of times you don't realize what you have when you have the Holy Ghost. A lot of times people don't understand the true value of being Holy Ghost filled. But I'm a witness. I, even though I may have forgotten, God didn't forget. Because through the situation of having to deal with certain things along that, that range, when I went to counseling, when I you know, uh, received medication and all of these different things, the Holy Ghost was still there letting me know exactly what path to take. When it came to choosing who I needed to listen to, even um, I know that there's a plethora of counselors and doctors out there, but when you are in that state of where you don't understand where you are or what you're dealing with because of trauma, because of all kinds of situations, it's the Holy Ghost that tells you where you need to go. And that voice is still there. And the Lord will tell you, he will direct you to what counselor, what person, even though you've gone through all of the list and, and everything. And so the reason why people aren't taking advantage of it is that many times, if you don't have a foundation in God beforehand, or if you don't have a foundation in God to know just what you have, sometimes you push those things to the side. 
and you don't realize you know, what that gift is. So they're not taking advantage of it because many people, if they've been regenerated, they don't understand. They don't know that the Holy Ghost is there. They forget. However, when you come to yourself like the prodigal son and God brings you back into the fold and brings you to where you know that you know that you know, then all of a sudden it's almost like the light bulb switches on and you start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And, at the, and who is shining the light? Nobody but Jesus. And so as you go forth, you, you take one step after another step and you are being led by the Holy Ghost. Let me add to the so, question. What, you, what does comfort look like when, when God comforts you? What, what does that look like, Sister Nietzsche, Minister Nietzsche? It's when he takes me in his arms and he wraps me and he tells me I'm loved, I'm okay, and it's all right. That's what comfort looks like. That's what it looks like when you're down in your doldrums. That's what it looks like when you're near to being, you know, no more, where you're just about to give up. It's when Jesus reaches his hands out to you. Hallelujah. And you grab hold and you know God is going to pull you through. And your hope is reestablished. Your trust is reestablished. And in that moment, you know who you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Nitra. Question number four. I think it's time for a praise break. Can we just clap our hands one time and give God some praise? He's a comforter. In our darkest hour, he's a comforter. Thank you. What a mighty God we serve. Thank you. Question number four. We, we, we read a lot of Bible. We talk a lot about scripture. How can scripture from the Bible, so we're talking about from the Bible, not from the Quran, but from the Holy Bible, help a person overcome? How can the scriptures help us to overcome mental challenges? This is Minister Tim. Well, one, one of the things that I must say first is that oftentimes as uh, saved individuals, people think we don't think certain things are real like mental health. Mental health is real, but we also know God is real, and we know God is greater than all things. So what, what happens at times when we experience mental health, mental challenges, is there are voices. And I'm not talking about... Um, anything schizophrenic at this time. I'm talking about the voices that people take. Well, you're not going to be anything. You know, you know, you can't do this. You can't do. So the word of God has to become the stronger voice in you. Yes. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. One of my favorites, I remember, God is our refuge and our strength. Very present help in a time of trouble. Only God can be very present because that's before present. So before things happen, he's already there. So those scriptures, you have to repeat. You have to repeat the word of God because he's given us scripture for all things that we go through. There's nothing new. So when we're going through those challenges, which we do, no person in the church can raise their hand and say, oh, I, I, I don't get down sometimes. But those down thoughts can be. And we are all witnesses. I'm not talking to people who've never heard it before. Haven't heard, the, saw the Lord speak through you, through the scriptures. So you have to learn the scriptures, whether we do the ABCs, we have to learn them. And that way, when the enemy speaks one thing, we speak another. And, and at that point, God can take control of your mind. The word of God has to be the strongest voice. Amen. My God. I think it's time for another praise break. <laughs> the word of God has to be the strongest voice. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Tim Staples. Question number five. I'll turn to my right this time. Uh, um, Pastor Freeman, explain how your time in prayer should help you overcome mental challenges. We talk a lot about prayer. Pastor Stevens talks a lot about prayer. Tell me, how, how is that time? How does it help you? How does your prayer time help you? Talk to us, my friend. Absolutely. So, so prayer is both a connecting and a disconnecting. Um, it is my connecting with God, who, as uh, Tim has so eloquently said, who is a very present help in time of trouble. It's my connecting to him, knowing 
um, that, that I have a confidence um, that whatever it is that I'm dealing with, what I'm facing, what you're dealing with, what you're encountering, is that the God of the universe, the God who created us from the dust of the uh, earth and breathed into us the breath of life and we became a living being, that in that time of prayer that we become what God has already purposed and planned us to be. And secondly, we are now disconnected um, from the issues and the vicissitudes of life. It, it's when I'm in that place. There, there's an old hymn, the church church was founded on the hymns ask the savior to help you comfort strengthen and keep you he is willing to aid you he will see you through and so when I go into that place of prayer I'm connected to God and disconnected now from whatever it is that is clouding my mind or my judgment and when we come out of that place of prayer four things are going to happen one of one God is going to speak to us there is no condemnation that that when we go into God's presence we're not condemned for anything that we're thinking we're not condemned for anything that we've done. We're not condemned for any uh, wayward thoughts we have. There is no condemnation. It's as the minister here said that God will wrap his arms around us and tell us that we're loved and we're forgiven and we're free and we're uh, restored. The second thing that would happen is that there will be no conflict. That God will speak um, his voice to us and we will walk away from that place of prayer um, not with any conflict knowing that we have heard heard um, the master speak. We have heard his voice. And when others might say, don't do this, if God say do this, there's no conflict. The third thing uh, that we'll walk away from with no concerns. The Bible says that we can cast our cares upon him um, because he cares for us. And so if I just put it in his hands, I don't have to walk out of the place of prayer uh, with it in my hands. That There are no um, concerns. And then lastly, there is no confusion. Um, I have this confidence that God will, in fact, deliver. God, in fact, will um, heal. God, in fact, will restore. God, in fact, will rejuvenate. And so when I go into prayer, I'm connecting to God and it's disconnecting me um, from the things that uh, took me there. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. What, what a wonderful response. With all you said, I need to go back to this question again. Sister Carol, if you answer this question again, based on what uh, Pastor Freeman said, prayer seems to be a mind regulator yes. and heart fixer. Yes. What, what do I, what, why am I experiencing so much mental anguish after we hear this wonderful response on prayer? Uh, so help me, why, so are we not praying? Is that the issue? Or, or are we not spinning? Based on what he, he said, it seems to me that the church ought to be experiencing a high level of peace. Explain how the prayer time should help us overcome mental illness. Can you help us to give a little more insight on this? Because it seems what Pastor Freeman has said, the solution is prayer. What are we missing here? Time. Mike. Oh. We're missing time in prayer. Yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest element. What do you mean we're, we're missing we're time? Not, we're not taking the time to spend in prayer, to be completely committed to the Lord, time that's designated just for him. We're not taking that time out. And, and what's so beautiful about prayer, you can pray anytime, anywhere, and in any circumstance. You can be in the midst of trouble, and folks don't have to even realize that you are calling on the Lord in the presence of you, he and you. Others don't even have to know that. So oftentimes we don't remember to keep in mind it, that's why the Bible said men ought to always pray and, and without ceasing. We, every circumstance and situation in life, we ought to be praying about it, no matter what's going on. If we keep prayer first and foremost, so I'm going to even go further. If we listen to our pastor, <laughs> who is really huge on prayer, if we are praying constantly, the regulation that God will give you in your mind is amazing. The comfort, the peace, the relief from anxiety. It's just so many things that you get from prayer. Studies have even been done. Uh, in, in, in 2019, uh, this guy from Harvard did a study on prayer and people and their mental health. 
And what he discovered is that people who prayed on a, with regularity, that their mental health issues were relieved far greater than those who did not pray. So when you realize that you're dealing with a higher being, which is God himself who created you, who made your mind, and you believe those things, then prayer helps mental health. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Carol. Amen. Sister Carol, you seem to identify that, that time or the lack of time is the culprit of us not being where Pastor Freeman suggests. I'll turn to you, Minister Nietzsche, then what? Why don't we spend time? If, if the problem is time or the lack of time or the lack of discipline, we've disciplined time, we put them together. Why aren't we spending the necessary time with God to get those benefits that Pastor Freeman just talked about? Okay, well, I can, oh, sorry. I can only speak um, again from my own experience in terms of how it was for me. A lot of times, if someone is in the throes of a, of a mental health or an, or an illness that's taking them out of it, typically the things that were in place spiritually were, are not in place. So in other words, for me, when I went through my situation, I wasn't where I was supposed to be spiritually. What, was your, what was your situation? My si you went through your situation. You want to explain that? Would you like to? Or oh, we'll come back to that. We'll I, I will explain it, but okay. We'll in terms of where I was, the life situations put me in a, in a state where I wasn't doing what I should have been doing as a child of God. Okay? So I'll put it like that. Okay. And in all honesty, I wasn't praying and I wasn't in my word like I should have been. Okay? And I just wanted to escape. Now, my escapism wasn't the norm of what most people do. I mean, mine was just maybe I might just be doing something else other. I mean, I've never been, I'm not a drinker, I'm not a smoker, I'm not a person that does drugs or anything like that. So those are what everybody thinks that everybody does, but that's not true. You have people that can find other avenues of escape, yes. uh, whether it be television, movies, whether it be a uh, uh, job, you know, all kinds of other things that take your mind or take you away from doing the things that you need to do as a child of God. We, we know them as, I, I'm calling them escapisms, but they also can become idols, idols as well, and we all know that. So what I'm saying is, for me, I wasn't doing what I should have been doing. I wasn't, um, what is it? praying like I should have been praying. I wasn't in my word like I should have been doing. I wasn't doing any of those things. So then when the throes of life hit me, I did not have my armor on. I did not, I was not standing like a soldier in the army of the Lord. So I had, you know, I got hit, I got injured, I got damaged and, and all of that. And so I, I didn't, I wasn't doing that. Again, I was in a state of, if you will, for lack of a better term, having backslid. You know, so when you see someone that's not doing certain things like that and they know the Lord, they've walked with God, they've got a foundation with God, and all of a sudden they stop, you've backslid. So that's what that means. Mm -hmm. And so in order to not do that, what do you have to do? You have to come to yourself, repent, then you have to get back onto the horse, so to speak, and start praying, asking for forgiveness, having God work that work of repentance within you, and then you start to pick up and go forth. Now, the difference is that once you've experienced having been injured while in, in, in battle, spiritual battle, the good thing about it is if you learned, then you, you're going to make sure you're never getting in that situation again. Amen. So then that means that you're going to make sure you're going to be a, pray, a person that prays, daily, a person that stays in the, in the word all of the time, Amen. you're going to be, you're going to be constantly staying where you lost your spot before. Thank you. Thank you very Sorry. much. Thank you for that response. Uh, and, uh, Minister Tim, I want to turn to you. These are, I'm asking each of you a question on prayer and you all have responded very well. We, we say pray, we assume people know how to pray. We, we have identified prayer as being a key pivotal change in our, in our lives if we walk with God. But how does one learn to pray? Where, where does it come? Did we say, go pray, go talk to the Lord. How does one? Is, is there levels of efficiencies in prayer? Just take two, one minute, two minutes, maybe one minute and a half. 
One thing it is that our pastor have given us tools, the ABCs of prayer. You know, we, we know that. The other thing is experiencing prayer with others. You learn how to pray um, by listening to others and being in corporate prayer with others. Um, that's how I learned to pray, um, by being invested in that, in that time and understanding. And the word of God helps us and teaches us how to pray uh, by just the word, by the word, what are we praying for to understand having faith, you need that first um, in order to do prayer. Um, and one thing I wanted to add, Pastor, you asked me a critical question the other time. You asked a lot of critical questions. I know you probably don't remember. Uh, but my family meets every Tuesday in a Zoom prayer. And so you've been checking on us and you said, you know, why? You, know, I have, you didn't say why. You said, what keeps you all going? And the answer to that is answers. Our family, you know, we pray a lot of prayer, but when a family get together, we have seen attitudes of family members change. Amen. People God. have been blessed. So that's one of the things that we're struggling to get that time for prayer. Yeah. We get in prayer and you see results and, you know, you won't stop praying. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Amen. Amen. These are great answers. You all are doing a wonderful job. This is rapid fire. We're going to hear from each one of you, but I'd like you to give you one, just one minute to, to just share. And we want to keep you at one minute, but I'm going to ask each of you the same question. Question number six, what, what scripture would you use to fight fear? Uh, Pastor Freeman, what, what scripture do you use to fight fear? One minute response, please, sir. So, of course, we know Timothy said that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Two things. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of fear is real. And so David in Psalm 56, I believe, said in times when I am afraid, I will trust in you. And so I think it's when we're recognizing um, those elements of fear um, that are creeping into our lives, those times Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me. Those times when I am afraid, I will trust in you. Psalm 56, and I believe it's verse 1, 2, and 3, somewhere thereabout. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Anitra, Chris, what, what scripture would you use to fight fear? Well, the one that, the whole Psalm of 23 for me, because it is, when I read that psalm, I always envision myself performing the action. And so as I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and I'm putting myself in that position of saying, I'm going to fear no evil. Why? Because thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. And then I start to see how surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. And then the, the, the caveat, the ending part of it, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In other words, that whole, I visualize myself in that, that psalm, in it, so that I know that, you know, it's possible. And I've done that off and on throughout my life. And of course, there are other scriptures, you know, as um, Elder said, and then as some other people are going to say, um, another one was um, 30, Psalm 34 and 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears, you know. So anywhere in the word of God, I mean, you, you can look it up, and, and, and just wherever you go, you get this comfort, and you know that God is there, and you're not alone. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Tim Staples, what, what scripture do you, would you use to fight fear? I use two. One, I ask myself a question, and depending on the answer, I do an action. I say, Tim Staples, if the Lord is your light and your salvation, are you really supposed to be fearing anybody? That's what the scripture said. Then at that point, if my answer is, ah, I'm still afraid, then I seek the Lord. And he will hear me, and he will deliver me. So 27, 34 work together. I use 34 if 27's answer meant, yeah, I'm still scared. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Staples. Amen. Sister Carol, well, what scripture do you, in your, in the, when you're feeling fearful, what scripture do you use to fight fear, to overcome fear? My two favorite have already been mentioned, so I'm simply going to repeat them. The first one, of course, is God did not give me 
the spirit of free fear. So the first thing I come up with, I the God, God's power allows me not to be afraid, and then He gives me, a, He gives me um, love, excuse me, power, love, and of a sound mind. So He gives me the mind to go past this fear. So that's my first, and then of course. My friend over here, he mentioned the second one, which is the Lord is my light and my uh, salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If God is the strength of my life, it means that he's with me everywhere I go. He is always present. Well, whom shall I fear? And I have been in situations where I have... People, folks have attempted to intimidate me of a higher, let's say, level. And uh, the Lord has always given me just the words. I'm, because he is with me at all times. My God. My God, thank you. Wow. I feel like running after all this. Amen. Let's move on. Let's give a, it's time for a praise break one more time. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. One, one minute response on the next question, number seven, number six. Um, well, number seven, sorry. What scripture would you use to fight depression? We talked a lot about depression during a Mental Awareness Month. Talk to us, Pastor. One minute. What scripture would you use to fight, to fight depression? Yes, you may read it, sir. Amen. First Peter chapter 5 and verse um, 7. The word of the Lord says, cast all of your care, your anxiety, your concerns upon him, um, for he careth for you. How do you do that? How do you do How that? How do you cast your cares upon the Lord? You do that by faith. It's just recognizing that, God, I cannot handle this, but you can. I, I can't deal with this, but you can can i can't manipulate this but you can move this and so it's my recognizing um, that i am finite and he is infinite and in my finite mind i can't handle the vicissitudes of life those things that come to me but this infinite god who knows all things who knows the ending from the beginning who knows uh, yesterday he knows tomorrow, yesterday, that this God knows exactly what the outcome is going to be. And so I'm going to rest in uh, the promise of God. I'm going to rest in the presence of God and, and allow his promises and his presence to envelop my circumstances. And in the presence of the Lord, then there comes fullness of joy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pest. And this is so good. I hope that you're enjoying this, those on social media, because here in the sanctuary, we are enjoying these responses. Amen. I turn the same question to you, uh, Minister Nietzsche. Chris, what scriptures would you use to fight depression? Well, I had the first one that Elder said, but I'm going to also add for me would be Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, because it's telling me what I need to do in order to deal with things. It's trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And, I, and that's the first step for me is trusting in God with all of my heart because I even, you have to understand having gone through this, I knew that I was in a bad place. And then I had to really realize that uh, I have to lean not to my own understanding. People that know me, they know that I analyze, I think, I make connections, and I've got to know why and all of that. So sometimes when bad things happen or things happen that, that get you, you know, get upset the apple cart, you want to know why. Well, when you are trusting in the Lord, you have to give it all over to God and not worry about the why. Just know that he is able to do all things hallelujah and he's able to uh, to to put it in a way that you can deal with it so i lean not to my own under understanding i don't try to explain it i just trust in god and then of course i'm going to acknowledge him in every way that i go and that's key for me because dealing when you deal with depression or you deal with not 
being quite right yourself, you want to be able to acknowledge God. Getting back to what we talked about earlier, you want to have that prayer life. You want to have that ability to seek God and have him answer your questions or lead you or direct your path. So you acknowledge him in all of your ways. And of course, he will direct your path. Amen. Yes. He Amen. will direct your path. Amen. God bless you. Because of our time, I'm going to, I'm going to move along a little bit here. Um, Minister Staples, Tim Staples. Tell me, uh, what, what scripture would you use to fight stress? We dealt with fear, we dealt with depression, now we're dealing with stress. What scripture would you use to fight stress? Um, my scripture has a little bit about fear to it, but it is Deut Deuteronomy 31.8. And the Lord, he is that doth go before me. He's already ahead of me. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. Stress, you get dismayed, you get troubled. So I know that God has already gone before me. Everything that we deal with, Jesus has already dealt with it and took it to the cross. He that have gone before me will deliver me. So I don't need to be stressed about it. I don't need to be dismayed, pastor, but, you know, you, you should do a whole message. We are. Think about the last time you get mad. You didn't think about it. Let's take it to the Lord in prayer. We, we do mess up on this sometimes, pastor and saints, and we got to stop because the Lord is trying to heal our body, keep us healthy, and we just get upset. But know that God went before us, and we have to practice thank that. Thank you. Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And he's a great answer. Thank you. Yeah. Sister Carol, question number nine. Um, why do you think so many people reject mental health? Why do you think so many people reject mental health offered from the Bible? We've been hearing a lot of things about the Bible, the Word of God, prayer. But why are people rejecting the mental help offered by the Scripture? You all have quoted some wonderful Scriptures today. Why are people, assuming that people do reject it, I think that's understood. Why? Okay, we're not just talking about the few that are regular church people. We're talking about people in general, as well as saints. I don't think that they reject mental, the, the help from the Bible. I don't think they reject it. I don't think they know it, enough of it. I when it comes to scriptures, you have to be a studier or learner of the word. You have to be a part of Bible class. You have to be a part of Sunday school. You have to be a part of, of listening to the sermons and digesting it. Not just listening, but actually digesting it where you can regurgitate it when you get, get home or in other circumstances. So I don't think that it's that people reject it. They don't know enough of it. I think the scripture that tells us that in the last days, uh, all that's happening, you know, men are going to be lovers of themselves, love of, lovers of money, self-assuming, not haughty, blasphemy. It's so much of that that's in the world. I think people become uh, caught up with the problems of the world and they don't know enough scriptures to back to fight it. That's why Sister Nidra said that she didn't have the whole armor of God on. So people don't know how to put on the whole armor of God. And if you don't know the word of God, you don't know the armor of God. So it comes from the lack of knowledge and being so caught up. I mean, it's just so easy to avoid the word of God. I have a friend that does not know a whole lot about the Bible, but every time he gets questioned, he calls me. And uh, I'm able to explain the scripture to, him, to this person. But it's one thing that I have learned from this discourse is how much of the word has actually been put in me. Because sometimes as I'm explaining it, I'm shocked myself <laughs> at my own you know, knowledge. So, I would say to anybody, attend Sunday school, attend Bible study, 
Listen to the preaching on Sunday mornings attentively. Take some notes and then go home and reread those scriptures and go over the word. Oh because God. the more you get in you, the more it can come out of you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Great responses. Stanidra, we're going to turn to you. Question number 10. Last month, we discussed many causes of mental illness because last month was Mental Awareness Month. We had speakers and panels discussion as well. And today we're wrapping this all up. Last month, we discussed many causes of mental illness, such as trauma, hereditary causes, injury to the brain, substance abuse, etc. In your opinion, we heard a, a, a plethora of reasons, but in your opinion, what is the primary cause of mental illness and what can be done about it? Can you sum that up in two minutes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. In my opinion, I think that all of whatever mental health and all of it that it pretends, it started in the garden with the fall. And I said, sin. To me, I think sin is the primary cause of all of the afflictions and things that plague mankind. Why do I think that? I think that when... Adam and Eve fell. What was the, the falling point? What did they do? They ingested the fruit that gave them knowledge of good and evil. And with that, God had said that when you, if you did something like that, death would come into the, to the equation. So that when you add good and evil and death, you, it equals sin. If you look at good, evil, and death, and you look at how it attributes to the things that happen to people which cause, if you will, mental health uh, illnesses, as you have in the question, trauma, hereditary, drugs, all kinds of things, those things stem, they don't stem from goodness, they stem from evil. And wh where are they going to lead? They're going to lead to death. So that's my way of looking at it, is that it, is start it started from and there. And what can be done about it? Oh my goodness, well. In, in, a, in a minute. <laughs> Okay, in a minute. Well, see, the Lord gave the answer to that, too, in the same book. If you, if you go into Genesis, when he foretold of what he was going to do in terms of giving a Savior to the world. If you are dealing with being regenerated, yes, those things are going to, those things are going to be changed in a way because we're going to get his spirit. We're going to get the Holy Ghost. We're going to get power from on high. We're going to be able to uh, look and, re and, and read the word, digest the word. We're going to be able to deal with our situation in the spiritual rather than in the natural. When you look at mental health and all of that, you're dealing with it, if you will, with the medications and the counseling and all of that, Amen. and they're wonderful, but it's in the natural, Amen. but it's in the spiritual that you get your healing. Amen. Thank you for that response. Question number 11 is a, trans is a kind of a being transparent question. If you could be brief, each of you, our time is short. This is so wonderful. We may have to go a little bit over a few minutes. But can you share with us a personal testimony of how you overcame either fear, depression, or anxiety? Can you share it maybe two minutes or so, Pastor, how you overcame it? I knew you were going to turn to me for that one. <laughs> I absolutely do. So I, I don't deal with um, fear. I, I don't deal much with worry. But there was a season in my life where... Um, I was blanketed by depression. Um, I am a giver. I'm a person who sows into others and often found myself not on the end of reciprocation. Um, no one was calling me unless they needed a question answered from the Bible or they needed prayer or a hospital visit or can you do a funeral or can you perform a wedding? But could you just call me to go bowling? Could you call me to uh, go grab a bite to eat? And I found myself oftentimes struggling between um, the dichotomy of thought of being either alone or perhaps lonely. And sometimes those two things are, are so paired um, to each other. God said it's not good for a man to be alone in the context of relationship. Um, but there are times when even in a marital um, relationship, one feels alone. Um, even though you have that spouse there, he or she may feel um, alone. And so I, I sought counsel from 
a dear pastor in Saint, in Cincinnati, rather, um, went to him and just shared with him of my struggle, pastoring a church that's growing and laying hands on people, anointing them with oil, praying, speaking um, the word of life over them, but there was no one speaking the word uh, of life over me. And uh, he shared with me uh, that he struggled with that same dichotomy, that same dynamic, rather. Um, and there we, uh, in his office, we prayed, and then we realized that God had used us to be a seed, um, to be deposited into uh, the lives of others, and at the right time, and this is now one of those um, seasons where I'm experiencing it, that the harvest of relationships, the harvest of friendship, the harvest of joy um, will, will come. But I had to pour out um, that I might get Amen. the time to be poured into. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So, Denitra, same question. Well, I dealt with depression and suicide. So, for me, and that was a good 30 years ago. I'm going to be honest with you. That's why I know Jesus is a healer. Yes. Because uh, 30, 35 years ago, I didn't want to live. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know how quickly I can say it, but God never... He is the author and the finisher of the faith if yes. you've been saved. Yes. And he never leaves you alone. And even when I moved, he didn't. Right. When, I mo when I was moving and I was just dying, I can tell you what it feels like. In us, we have a spirit. My spirit was dying. When my spirit was dying and it got to that point where I didn't want to live anymore, then my mind kicked in. Well, what do we do? then we kill ourselves. That's what happens when you deal with suicide. But you, the Holy Ghost was there. The Holy Ghost was there. And the Holy Ghost said, you will not die this day. And he's, the Lord was just beginning to deal with me. And as I was going through the throngs of depression and dealing with it in the matter of that, then God had people call me. My, my, at the time, I lived here. And my mother lived in, Saint, uh, in California, and she calls. And then all of it, I get all of these phone calls. And then God begins to just turn it around, and I start seeing an array of hope. Like I said before, when you look through the glass and you look down the tunnel and you see that ray of light and you know it's Jesus, and he's offering his hand, you grab his hand, and then he pulls you up out of thank it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Minister Stable, two minutes. Two minutes, okay, no problem, Pastor. I, I think it's something that you 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 knew about. So um, the one thing is, I'm not a big sharer, so I'm a very big, good hider. And so it was recently You're a good hi hider, yeah. So I'll hide. praise the Lord, you know. So hider, <laughs> praise the Lord, hide, hider, okay. hide behind, hide, hide. hide. Like, so you know, I want. So there are some things medically that only Pastor and Lady D know, and a couple of people, my family don't even know. So. I was going through that change that we talked about, and then I oh went in my, I was in my, it was a period I just wanted to go home, sit on my couch. I didn't want to be anywhere else. I did not really want to be around people. Couldn't wait to get out of meetings. Couldn't wait to get out of church. I wanted to go home. And so how I overcame that was our family prayer. We were praying and 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 just kept praying and, and reading and praying. And the thing about this, how tricky it is. I didn't know I was in something until I came out of it. And I came and told you, like, I I had something going on and I didn't know it. So that's why we have to, Is it, yeah, don't tell all your business, but every time pastor asks me, he talks to me, Lady Dia, say something to me. A couple other people in Church of Noble say something to me. You know, um, you, yeah, you can't put it on Facebook, but talk to your pastor, talk to your good friend, talk to your prayer partner. But that's what it was. And Amen. That's how I came Thank out. you for sharing. So the Carol. Can you share with us a personal testimony of how you overcame fear, depression, or anxiety? Okay, mine is probably going to be a little funny. As a kid, okay, I've always been, I have a huge family, so I've never been alone. <laughs> but I, I used to have to walk to school by myself by the time I got in the fourth and fifth grade. And there was a dog, a couple of dogs, that were always at a certain spot as I walked towards my bus stop. I, and they would bark as if they were going to really come after me. And I, I was so frightened. <laughs> but there was a song I had learned at church. And it says, Jesus build a fence all around me 
every day. I know you can, yes, Lord. If you will, yes, Lord. Fight my battle if I be still. Now, you say you were fourth or fifth grade? Yes. Wow. I learned that in the, as, a, as a kid in the, about fourth grade, I would sing this song. So when I, as I got older and I started experiencing a little bullying, um, I probably didn't know it was bullying at the time, but it was. And uh, anything that would come to me, I would, that song would pop in my mind. Jesus, build a fence. And he did. So as I became older, that has always been Jesus is my fence. And I know that he is my fence because it just so many circumstances have come up in my life. So I've not really experienced any um, other situations because that song has always been there. I don't care what was going on so in my life. So you have learned to minister to yourself. Yes, I learned to minister to myself. Thank and you. Thank you. Wonderful oh. response. And thank you. All right, time is real short, but let's take a few more questions we can. Uh, Pastor Parker, Deuteronomy 28, 29 says, The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. Here, God was warning the Israelites about rebelling and worshiping the Canaanite, Canaanite, Canaanite gods. Mental illness would be one of the results of rebellion. Can rebellion against God contribute to mental illness? Talk to us, sir. Sure, absolutely. Romans 1, uh, as an example, talks to uh, us about God turning them over um, to a reprobate mind um, because they were not pursuing or following um, the path, the plan that God had outlined. And so sin, uh, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and witchcraft um, brings us into uh, a plethora of things that will um, fight against our mind and our uh, mental soundness. And so absolutely, um, a reprobate mind could happen as God turns one over um, because of that sin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question number 13. I'll ask each of you to just give me the name and a sentence. Can you give me the name of, of one biblical character, character who struggled with depression and overcame it? We'll start with you, Sister Carol. Can you, one of, each of you give me one name of a, one character who struggled with mental illness? Job. And I think that's, we all know, because we've studied Job, and uh, we know that when all things started coming against him, and uh, we know that he went into depression. And, um, but he kept his faith. So I, I, I would turn that to say, anybody who's going through depression, keep your faith. Amen. Hold on to your faith. God can Amen. bring you out. Amen. God bless you. Minister Staples. Uh, I would say David, uh, 42, Psalms 42 and 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted with me? Amen. Amen. Sister, Sister Nitra. I said David. Mike. Mike. Oh. I said David as well. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> and what, mental, what situation showed his mental state? I think that state? it was where when you, when you ask, create in me a right spirit and a clean heart, I think that speaks to me. I know it speaks of repentance, but it also speaks that he was in a point where he was down and he knew how to get his help. So Psalms 51 was for me. Very good. Very good. Peter, one who walked with Jesus, saw his miracles, saw him raise the dead, open blinded eyes, yet comes a point in time where he is challenged for walking with this Jesus. And he says, I never knew him. I, I don't know this man. I do not know this man. But the hope here is that Jesus came and said, Peter, I've prayed for you. And uh, when you are converted, you can go strengthen your brothers because you have been strengthened by me. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Sister Carol, question number 14. We're almost done. Uh, do mentally ill people go to heaven? That is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we thought we would ask it tonight. First, the Bible does not speak directly to that. However, the Bible speaks about the mercy and the grace of God and that there are certain things that are in the hands 
of God. And the Bible does talk about, um, let's say, when you when a person is is unable to understand. Okay, the scripture, Romans 1 and 20, I'll read that one. It says, for his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Well, a person who is mentally ill and cannot comprehend those things, they have an excuse. That's all I can say. <laughs> that was a good answer. But because right? God does not, uh, it does not speak directly. But yes, I believe. I, I don't just believe. I know. Yes, they're gonna. There's a heaven. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sister Carol. Question number fifteen. I believe we have one more question. Um, question number fifteen. In your opinion, I turn to you, Sister Nitra, here at Temple Church of Christ. In your opinion, how can Temple Church of Christ, as we have an IC three program? help address the mental illness crisis that we are experiencing. Amen. How can that happen? Sister Blue is, Dolores Blue is chairperson there, chair of that, working with Sister Dolores, with Sister, uh, um, and he says Blue is, is chair over that. Uh, but how can this IC3, IC3, we have a program here of talking to guests and friends who come into the church, whether young or old, white or black, straight or, or, or not straight, uh, the, how can the IC3 program help mental illness here, the crises of mental illness in here in well, St. Louis? If I understand the question correctly, inside of the church here, we are called to greet and, and welcome people into the church, you know, and that's what we do. Um, I, I don't think that I, I personally, I'm not doing it because, because there's some sort of special program, but I think that we are all called to do that as witnesses so that if I'm at the grocery store, if I'm no matter where I am, I understand that uh, I bring the church with me. So I understand that whatever I see going on or wh whomever I'm going to be addressing and be with, you know, I always pray and say, Lord, give me the words to say. So I don't know that um, it's any different than when the Lord was telling the, 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 the apostles and the 120 in the upper room to wait on the Holy Ghost at the, you know, at the beginning or the start of the church, that they were going to be endued with power from on high that, so that they could be witnesses. Uh, to me, the IC3 program is just another um, extension or, or variation of witnessing because you don't know who comes through your doors, whether they be you know, saved or unsaved. But the bottom line is you can extend your hand in, in, in welcoming and in worship and, in, and, and, and making someone feel loved and, and, and accepted and then to pick up the pieces from where they are. I mean, Amen. That's Amen. Thank you. All the responses have been wonderful. Can we give them a big hand? Yes. Wonderful responses. Well, we covered a lot of questions tonight, and I wanted to give you a, a one-minute closing remarks. Each of you, you and perhaps you were saying, Pastor, I wish you had asked this question because I had a response to this question if you had asked this question. So what I'm going to do, we're going to ask each of you as an attorney would close his closing arguments to his juror. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make your closing remarks to uh, our audience online as well as those who are in, in the congregation here. We're talking about resetting your mind with the word of God. Uh, we're closing up on our Mental Awareness Month. Of course, this is the first Wednesday in, in June. But say something to the audience that, will, that you think that they need to hear concerning mental illness, the word of God, and resetting our minds. We'll give you one minute. Sure. First, um, Bishop, I want to um, applaud and honor you for um, being the visionary behind this needed topic. Um, thank you for including me among um, these amazing panelists. Uh, indeed, I have been blessed. The word of the Lord tells us to comfort um, the feeble-minded. And so when we start talking about mental uh, health and mental illness, um, there are dimensions, there are degrees, there are depths um, of challenges that um, all of us may be subject to um, dealing with. And here's what we know is that there is hope in Jesus. Um, there is hope uh, in the finished work on um, the cross of Calvary. 
And so um, that, that question that was asked of uh, uh, Minister Carroll, and uh, I agree with the challenge of that question. I simply want to say that heaven, um, heaven is reserved for those who have placed their faith and trust in the miracle imparted by the blood of Jesus. And so whether one is dealing with a mental issue or whether one is dealing with lying or one is dealing with this challenge or that challenge, the blood covers it. And so I believe that around the, um, the throne are the four and 20 elders and there are men and women who have struggled with mental health, uh, mental challenges, who will there be saying, holy, 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 thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, for thou has redeemed us. And so it indeed has been an honor to be with you. And I pick it up and say, why will they say that? Because they can answer. Romans 8.35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, hallelujah, for thy sake we are killed all the day long as we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And here's the, here's the one, 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. Amen. And I just uh, thank God that we do have a pastor that believes in more than just having church, but ministry, ministering to people um, and, uh, and teaching us how to minister to everyone. So one of the things, we've had wonderful sessions, and I go back to one session when we were talking about, um, we had some professionals up here talking about mental health. Now, there are things that we must say when we say certain things don't have a cure. That's true. But healing and cure are two different things. God can do all things. So let's remember that. And, you know, um, there was one when, but there, when individuals who are professionals were sitting here, if they would tell someone in their office, like, oh, yeah, there's a cure because, you know, Jesus, they would no longer have an office at my school. But we do know because as profession, you have to say certain things is not a cure, but God heals. God heals. And that's what we must remember in all of our work. Remember just a point of clarification. You distinguish between healing and the cure. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk just 30 seconds on that, please? Yes. So cure means that there is something that scientists, that the Lord has allowed scientists to find a man-delivered way yeah. in order to end whether it's an illness or mental health. When it comes to healing, the healing divine that comes from the Lord, you know, is from God, and it doesn't need a man to impart it. So that is the difference. It is, it is the Lord. It, the Lord can do all things. So no matter what even I face, you know, I listen to the doctors because the Lord anointed them and gave them the knowledge. But at the end of the day, who has the final say? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who has the final say? And we must remember that. Amen. God bless you. Sister Carol. Okay. Mental illness can be the result of biological, psychological, or environmental factors. Just when, the fall, when man fell, we became fallen, our flesh and everything about us, which means that just like physical illnesses have increased, so has mental illnesses have increased. It's all a part of this body. So we, as saints of God, we must be empathetic and helpers of one another. We, have to, we should be very careful how we handle each other, how we talk with each other, just how we interact with each other. We should interact with each other with love, with care, with kindness to everybody. Everybody should be a recipient of your love. We should not look at people who may have, we may think have a problem with disdain because that is not the love of God. Just as God will heal a natural illness or, t or take someone through a cure, God can heal mental illnesses or take them through a cure. So we as children of God, I think we must commit ourselves to loving one another 
to the extent that we help one another overcome their mental illnesses through the love of God. Wow, let's give our panelists a big hand. Wow, let's give God a praise for what we have heard. These remarks have been absolutely phenomenal. They've been really great. I got to go back on Facebook and, and play this over again, this and this again, because your responses have been so encouraging and faith, faith building. Speaking of faith building, I want to invite someone to Christ. The best decision that I ever made is when I decided to say yes to Jesus. It's a place of salvation. We, we believe. We, we are saved by faith and not by our works. But when we believe God that something happens to our heart, there's a turning away from the world. It's called repentance. We're turning my direction. I'm now I'm following Christ. I regret that I have followed the world, but now it's a new start. And on the sign, you'll see a U-turn sign, which means to make a safe U-turn. I have a UP, a GSP on my phone, and every now and then they'll say, to make a safe U-turn, turn around. God wants you to turn around. Not, not to church, not to denomination, not to organization. He wants you to turn around to him, to come to him. So when you believe... You act on your belief because faith is dead without works. You get up and you come. And when you come, you believe and you trust him. And the evidence of your faith is to baptize in water in Jesus' name. And we're prepared to baptize folk any day. And have it being baptized and buried into the body of Christ and rise to the newness of life, then God grants you, he gives you a wonderful gift it's the gift of the Holy Ghost. He pours out his spirit upon you. and gives you a, a whole new life. And he gives evidence that he's with you. Some people reject the evidence. But God says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Sometimes we are selective. Well, God can bless me financially. And God can bless me with a house. And God can give me a scholarship. And God can do this. And, but when it comes to spiritual things... We start to get selective. But God says, if you believe me, any man who thirsts, come unto me and drink. He that bleeds upon me, as the scripture has said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So we believe in receiving the Holy Spirit because we know that it's available and alive. And then God gives you a whole new life. I wonder today, if there's anybody out there who says, you know what, I'm going to make some changes in my life. Please check us out. There's a number on the screen. We invite you to call that number, and we will talk to you more about this wonderful salvation. It's a wonderful story about what Christ has done for us, and he can do the same thing for you if you simply give your life to him. So please make a decision. We would love for you to be a part of this church, but right now I want you to be a part of the body of Christ first. And then he'll tell you where to go, when to go. He'll do that. But first, seek Christ first. Please call that number and be a part of this wonderful salvation that we know. Amen? At this time now, we're going to have Elder Griffin to give us announcements for the week. Thank you, Pastor Stevens. Thank you to everyone that's tuned in to tonight's telecast. We pray you have enjoyed everything that you have heard on tonight. Tonight's are our announcements for Wednesday, June the 7th, 2023 at 7 o'clock p.m. Please remember that all times are Central Standard Times. The mission statement at Temple Church of Christ is that we swim, we serve, share, worship, win souls, intercede, and make disciples for Christ. Some of the ways we swim are shown in the following announcements. Join us for our weekly scheduled services. Christian Education meets every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock a.m., followed by our Sunday morning worship experience at 10.30 a.m. Don't forget to join us on Mondays for prayer over the telephone, 7 o'clock p.m., by calling the number you see on the screen, 508-924-3730. On Wednesdays, we fast from 12.01 a.m. until 4 o'clock p.m. And then we invite you to join us for in-person Bible study. Join us in person or online at 7 o'clock p.m. On Saturdays, join us for our Victorious Living teleconference call. That's at 9 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time by dialing 909-318-7708. Temple Church of Christ is in sympathy for TCOC members and families who have lost loved ones. Services are as follows and as well they are on the TCOC app. Mr. Marvin Mitchell, who is relatives of Mother Betty Mitchell, Minister Pamela Mitchell Thornton, Sister Sandra Mitchell, 
and Brother MJ. Services for him will be held on Tuesday, June 13th. Viewing will be held from 4 o'clock p.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. at the Lane Renaissance Chapel, 7302 West Florissant Avenue, St. Louis, Missouri. Celebration of Life will take place the following day, Wednesday, June 14th, 2023, 10 o'clock a.m. at the Kennerly Temple Church of God in Christ, 4307 Kennerly Avenue, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. Also join us in keeping the Mary Brown McCoy family in prayer and the loss of her son-in-law, Mr. Charles Wilson II. Services will be held on Friday, June 16th, 11 o'clock a.m. right here at Temple Church of Christ, 2741 Dayton Street, St. Louis, Missouri, 63106. On the same day, we'll have services for Mother Corrine Clark. Viewing will take place at 5 o'clock p.m., followed by a celebration of life at 6 o'clock p.m., also on Friday, June 16th, right here at Temple Church of Christ, 2741 Dayton Street, St. Louis, Missouri, 63106. Please remember to keep these families in your prayers during their time of bereavement. The TCLC ministers' credentials renewal fees are being accepted in the rear of the sanctuary immediately following worship services on Sunday mornings. You contact Evangelist Cheryl Oliver, Sister or Dr. Sandra Fields, or Minister Melissa Lindsay if you have any questions regarding your renewal fees. Outreach and Evangelism Intern Director, Waikita Lee, needs you to sign up for a six-week TCLC volunteer initiative. It takes place on Sunday, June the 18th, which is Father's Day, 10 o'clock a.m. to 11 o'clock a.m. at the Jefferson Spaces, 900 North Jefferson, St. Louis, Missouri. Please be sure to contact Sister Waikita Lee, and she'll be able to assist you. The uh, instructor for this session will be Evangelist Michelle Bailey. The theme is Who I Am Discover to You That Will Make the Difference in Your Tomorrow. The Temple Church of Christ TCLC Sisterhood Zoom meeting will be held on Tuesday, June 20th, 6 o'clock p.m. The speaker will be our very own Minister Yolanda Bissett, speaking on the topic of Esther. This year's theme is The Heart of a Godly Woman. We're asking all ladies to please read the book of Esther in preparation for the Zoom session. Join the TCLC Sisterhood for a one-day trip to Branson to see Queen Esther. Live on stage at the Sight and Sound Theater, sponsored by the Sisters of Rachel, the Sisters of Anna, who are geared by Minister Angela Pearson and Dr. Sandra Fields. Logistics are as follows. Saturday, September 23rd at 3.30 p.m. Round trip includes transportation and theater ticket. Cost for ages 13 and up is $120.00. Via the cash app, dollar sign, TCOC Sisterhood, or via check, you get that same amount. But if you're paying via a card or Givelify, your fee will be $122. Please be sure to indicate the Branson trip in the memo. Those who are ages 13 through 12, your cash price is $90, and your card price is $92. A $60 ref non-refundable fee is required to hold your seat. All deposits are due no later than Sunday, July 30th, with the final payment due by Sunday, September 13th. You'll hear more logistics as the event date does get closer. The Midwestern District Council presents its summer session. It starts Tuesday, June 27th through Friday, June 30th, 7 o'clock p.m. nightly at Greater Grace Church, 3690 Pershaw Road in Ferguson, Missouri. Come out and support the council. Some of the evening speakers include Evangelist Freedom Morrison, Suffolk and Bishop Julian Johnson, Bishop Jacqueline McCullough, and Bishop Larry O. Jones. Please be sure to register at the council's website, www-mdc-paw.com. Suffolk and Bishop Ron Stevens is our chairman. Bishop Larry O. Jones is diocesan. The Christian Education is excited to announce their new class starting on in July titled The Bible Study Methods. This will be led by our own Minister Nidra Chris. Whether you are a seasoned believer or you are new to the faith, young or old, this class is for you. Prepare for a transformative experience as you embark on your journey that will empower you to a diverse range of, of techniques and inspire you to dive deeper into the Word of God by equipping you with invaluable tools, this class aims to enhance your understanding and enrich your studies of the scriptures. If you are interested, please submit your name to Minister Yolanda Bassett. Christian education needs an accurate head count since they are purchasing materials for this class. Sister Natasha Williams is the director of Christian education. Congratulations to the 39 members who had perfect attendance in the month of May. They will all receive 
a $10 gift certificate after morning worship service on June 18th to use in the TCLC bookstore. Remember, if you are not able to meet the goal in May, you can definitely do it in June. You can do it, TCOC. The Christian Education Department current merge class continues and is taught by our very own pastor and Lady Stevens. This class is split into a six-week two six-week sessions, rather, to allow students and teachers to attend, and you are still encouraged to attend. If you are a new or prospective member of TCLC, the new members class has begun. Bishop Stevens is encouraging all those who have not taken the class to attend. Please see Sister Carol Battle Barnes to sign up today. Join the youth every Sunday, 10 to 30 a.m. for a popular and exciting film series, followed by an open floor discussion. Contact Elder Andrew Williams for those details. And we invite all Christian education youth workers to a teacher's workshop on Saturday, June 10th. All instructors will be requested to be in attendance, and we will provide continental breakfast and a light lunch. As always, we're reading the word of the Lord for the month of June. We're continuing with Ezekiel, and we'll conclude with 1 and 2 Corinthians for the rest of the month. Please go to the assigned scripture and check out your, your reading on your TCOC app under the events tab. That way we'll know that you are in compliance. As always, please remember these events can be found on Facebook, the TCLC app, and the TCLC website. They're also sent out via our Faith Teens text messages. Please be sure to check all modes of communication for all TCOC events. You're now back in the hands of Suffolk and Bishop Ron Stevens. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Griffin, for those announcements. And thank you, Change Media. Thank you, Brother Michael Crisp. And thank you, Elder Griffin, for your help tonight uh, for our uh, our PowerPoint presentation. Thank you so much. I do want to underscore the new class on study your Bible uh, is being taught by uh, Minister uh, Nietzsche, who's sitting here on the platform with us as well. And she's going to be teaching uh, methodologies. This is the, it's a big book, 1,189 chapters in this book. Uh, in this book, you'll find 39 uh, books in the Old Testament, amen. And you find 26 in the, in, the new, in the New Testament, 27 in the New Testament, a total of 66 books, over 30,000 scriptures in this Bible. Of the 30,000 scripture, 10% of them, three, about 3,000 come with promises. And there's a lot in this book. And as Sister Carl just mentioned in our presentation today, how important it is for us to really get the, to know the word of the Lord and not just come to church, but I know the word. I know the word. One of the greatest solutions to mental health is getting to know the word of the Lord. And so Minister Nidra is going to be teaching method, methodologies, how to study the Bible, how to appreciate the word of God. What are you reading? How are you reading? A lot of this requires discipline. Look, study requires discipline. Whether it's PhD, whether it's master's degree, whether it's a GED, at some level, you're going to have to master discipline. Discipline is so critical uh, as we move forward to our study. And what Sister Nietzsche is going to do is she'll teach those tools of discipline, how to read the word, how to appreciate the word of God. I fully support this class. And if you're not attending a Christian education class, those of you on social media, I want to invite you to our Christian education department. A man led by uh, Sister Natasha Williams and her team. They're doing a phenomenal job, and we're trying to provide you with the best information to help you survive and make it through the day. Amen? So please, please, this is Sister Nietzsche. Yeah, she's, she's a great teacher. She's teaching a class that's coming up uh, next this coming Sunday. July, I'm sorry, July. Oh, you got plenty of time to sign up. So you have July at my date. We want you to be a part of this. Get the word of God. In fact, the scripture says, let the word of God dwell richly in you. Let it dwell richly in you. You've got to get the word of God in you. And Jesus says, if my word abide in you, and ye abide in it, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. That is, if the word of God is alive in you, it's pulsating, it's living in you, man, there's nothing impossible that you cannot do. Amen. So we're encouraging everyone, particularly those on social media, to join us. You don't have to be a member of this church to attend our Christian education department. You can go to another church and come by and and enjoy some of our classes, then move on to your church, that's perfectly fine. We want you to be a part of this great salvation and information that is given. Amen. I'm still percolating, amen, over the wonderful presentation we had tonight. You all did a phenomenal, phenomenal job. 
These are great teachers and instructors, and we thank God for you so, so, so much. Let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you that we can reset ourselves by the word of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful privilege that we can come together either by social media or here in the congregation. We thank you for the opportunity that we can hear the word. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. We thank you for those who join us on this panel. We thank you for the wonderful discussion. And I pray that we can take something with us. And we can apply it in our lives. Let the word heal us. Let the word cure us, God, so that we can bring glory to your name. God, again, we thank you for those on social media. Thank you for those in the congregation. And we ask you to give us safety, those who are in the congregation, safety, safety as they leave this place and go to their various locations and destinations. Let us arrive there safely. And when we arrive, I pray that we'll find all well. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen is my prayer.